The sad part about all this is that the people don't see what's about to hit them. In my opinion, we have like a financial tornado or a hurricane coming their way, but they don't even see it. Hi, everyone. I'm Bethan Moorcraft, a reporter with MoneyWise.com. And today I'm very excited to welcome two very special guests to discuss the importance of emergency savings and retirement planning. I'm delighted to welcome Suze Orman and Devon Miller, co-founders of SecureSave, financial technology platform that helps people build emergency savings through employer benefits platforms. Suze, Devon, welcome. Thank you, my dear Beth. Do me a favor, call me Susie, because that's how everybody knows me. So, but go ahead, let's do this. All right. So first of all, I would like to focus on some of the headline stats in a recent SecureSave study. One of the big ones uh, was that 74% of Americans, um, including a good percentage of high-income consumers, are living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, Why do you think that is? You know, Beth, what happens is the more money somebody makes, the more money they spend. And they get used to spending that amount of money, no matter what income category they happen to be in. And then when something changes, such as inflation makes everything far more expensive and not just the eggs or the chicken or whatever, because all of that's coming down now, but your car insurance premiums, your home insurance premiums, property taxes, everything that affects you, all of a sudden you have far more expenses, even though they're the same expenses on the same income that you were used to living on. And before you know it, You're living what? On credit cards. You've spent all of your money. You really have no savings anymore. And so it's really just that simple. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, The other, I guess, highlight figure was that 67% of Americans can't even cover a $400 emergency savings expense, emergency expense. You know, first of all, how does this compare to recent years? Is this a problem that's growing? Yeah, that's higher. And actually, the reason why we asked that specific question uh, in the survey a few months back was the headline stat on that has been something like 40% can't afford a 400% or $400 emergency. And in our data and working with people uh, to fund their emergency savings, we were seeing data that tells us that that was likely higher. So we wanted to go out and survey and understand where we think it was as inflation had started to really kind of come in an impact. And we were not surprised to find that that number was much higher than kind of where it had been at about 40% over the previous few years before inflation really took a toll. Mm-hmm. People, so in, in the survey, it's clear that people have cited inflation as kind of like the driving factor um, in this problem. Can you share any tips for people watching um, to help kind of deal with inflation and, and kind of deal with the challenge of watching their purchasing power just slip away? Yeah, here's the truth of the matter is, believe it or not, inflation per se is starting to be less and less of a problem. So it's really important that people always see what's coming at them versus where they were. And what's coming at them right now that's really affecting their saving ability is interest rate escalation. So the interest rate on a mortgage, the interest rate on a car, the interest rate on their credit card debt, the interest rate on everything, home equity lines of credit. So they may have started out doing all right, even maybe they had a little savings, and now they're finding themselves in a situation, Beth, where if they did have a home equity line of credit at 3 or 4%, it's now at 9 or 10%. If they do have to buy a new car, even if it's a used car, It's not the inflated price anymore of the car, because car prices are starting to come down. It's the interest rate they're going to have to pay, even on a less expensive car, which makes it totally unaffordable. But yet it's a necessity because they need a car. So what's really starting to happen is the impact that high interest rates are really serving up a dish of I have to use all my money. I can't afford things anymore. So that, truthfully, today is the problem, even more so than inflation. 
And can I add to that, Beth? I mean, we see we when we ask when users use our app and they they interact with their emergency savings, we ask them what's the emergency. And for the last, I think it's nine months, the number one reason has been inflation. Up until about two months ago, it became the second, and it was a pretty. Uh, pretty sizable shift. And um, I think it matches to what Susie's talking about, what you're seeing in the world. And, you know, as an example, I just saw a headline this morning in, in America, um, Home Depot uh, announced their earnings results. And it was way down, like they're the worst revenue they've had in something like 20 years. And so I think you're starting to see people adjust and react to that. Um, but the the other component, though, is, is that, um, again, as people are still trying to work their way through this, savings rates are still very, very low. 401k hardship withdrawals and loans are still very, very high. And so they're, they've maybe adjusted their spending, but they are still at a very precarious financial position as far as kind of what they have to go to access funds if they need it in an emergency. Thus, as Susie says, the interest rates are really going to be the big bear on people in the months ahead. The sad part about all this is that the people don't see what's about to hit them. In my opinion, we have like a financial tornado or a hurricane coming their way, but they don't even see it. We see it forming. And what I mean by that is when people look at their money, they also look at the available credit that they have on credit cards. So it goes, oh, I have money in my savings account, which many of them did because of what happened during the pandemic and all the stimulus checks and extra money that they got. Then as they spent that down, now what happens is they look at their credit cards and they start spending on credit cards. Then what happens is rather than spending and every month paying off that balance in full, they pay the minimum payment due. Then what starts to happen is they've used up all their credit limit and now they really can't even pay their credit cards. Then what happens is they are in trouble. So people tend to look at their credit cards as part of their emergency savings plan. They look at the equity in their home, part of their emergency savings plan. What they don't realize is that is not an emergency savings account. That's equity in your home. The credit card debt is way too expensive to use. So people don't understand the true need for an emergency savings account. And I'm not talking about the eight or 12 months you need in case you lose your job. I'm talking about people who are working today. They have a paycheck coming in, but they've maxed out on credit cards. They don't have a home or they're even, you know, they did a home equity line of credit already for something. And now the interest rate is too high and now their car breaks down. So now what do they do? Where do they get that money? Oh, now they go to the retirement accounts and take out a 401k plan, you know, money from their 401k plan. So we're talking about emergency savings accounts that are a serious necessity for what's really coming towards people. And they're not prepared for it, in our opinion, whatsoever. Yeah. It's really interesting. I'm, I'm definitely go we're going to dive into the uh, emergency savings account in one second. But a, a quick question before that: um, as you explained, Susie, a lot of people turning to their credit cards, consumer debt, and delinquencies are just on the rise. Um, do you have any tips that you can share to help people kind of pay off compounding debts like that um, without having to tap into their emergency savings? Yeah, what they need to do is. They need to have maybe one credit card if they have a credit limit on it still, and that should be their credit card. The other credit cards they have, they should cut up. They should not close them because if they close them, it will hurt their credit score. So just cut them up and get rid of them. Then you should line up all of your debt from the highest interest rate to the lowest. You should add up the minimum payment due on each one of those credit cards. And then you should add another 20% to that. And that's the money that should go towards the highest interest payment card. On all the other cards, you should freeze the minimum payment due. So if you're paying $30 a month right now on a credit card, if the next month comes in and they only want $28, no, you continue to pay the minimum payment due on all of those credit cards when you did this exercise 
plus the 20% for the highest interest rate. Then when that one's paid off, you take that amount of money and roll it down to the next one and the next one. And that's the best way to get yourself out of credit card debt along with stop spending money on your credit cards. Stop it, everybody. All right. So emergency savings accounts, um, a big part of you know what you provide at Secure Save. So can you just explain a little bit about how that works for people who don't know, you know what they are and what what you're offering. So the key thing to remember, actually, it's more about workplace emergency savings accounts. The the area that we really focus on is working with employers to launch emergency savings programs to their employees. It's very similar to a 401k or health savings account or something like that. Uh, and the so that's kind of one key dif- differentiator is, is that it's through work. It runs through your payroll. It's all automated. Um, it's much easier to sign up for and to use. But it's also just for emergencies. The key, the other key word there besides workplace is emergency. It's just for that purpose. And what we find is, is that it works better when you label and when you set aside and you really kind of work to remind yourself and, and to the people that we work with that this is just an emergency savings account. And so little things you'll see in the app. It's not a balance. It's your emergency savings. It's not a transfer button. It's get emergency money. And we really just focus uh, the people that use our product to remind them that that's that's what it's for. And they like it for that. And they really use it more effectively. The other key difference about a workplace emergency savings account, and this is really the most exciting part, is by far the most employers we work with provide an incentive. They give extra money to their employees to help them save. And it comes in different forms and things like that. But it can turn into something like as low as maybe a 10% annual rate of return equivalent or as much as 100%. And so it's easy to sign up for. It's going to keep you on track for this really important topic. And there's likely free money from your employer in it. And so right now, there's been this big trend of more employers launching these types of programs. And we work with them. And I would expect in the next few years, most people listening to this this video are going to likely have this type of account through their work. And we think it's going to be really impactful um, to help people save. That's excellent. So you're seeing a lot more uptake from employers. So is the next step now a bit more education um, among workers? Yeah, I think it's a combination. You know Go ahead, Susie. Yeah, I was just going to say what's interesting, Beth, is that right now, here's what people want. Everybody wants in their life. They want an easy way to save that's automated, where they don't have to think about it, where they can see their money growing. They know that it's safe and secured. It's FDIC insured. They know that nothing can happen to it. So they're not freaked out when they look at their 401k statements or anything and they see their balances going down and like, oh my God, look at this. They see their money growing. It's fun for them. They get to set the amount that they want to save every single paycheck. They love the fact that their employer is matching it. But you know what they love more? They love that they can access it anytime they need to. If they leave, they can take it with them. So it's the first time really in an employee's entire experience with an employer that they have money that they don't have to ask anybody to get, that it's their own, and they're being rewarded for doing something that they've always wanted to do. But you ask people to just do it on their own, they don't. So this is automated for them. They absolutely love it. So it's not even about the education part of it because the education, believe it or not, is not what they read in a book, not what they see in a video. The education is how it feels to them when they see their accounts growing and growing and growing. And all of a sudden, they have a $1,000 save for the first time in their life Compare that to the study that you mentioned, where most people don't even have $400. And now the education is, oh my God, I love how I feel. I love that I feel secure. Oh, I got secure by saving and I didn't even miss the money because it was $30 a paycheck. It was nothing. And then the education is, we have turned spenders into savers. And that is the greatest education anybody could ever get. And ultimately, it's about results. I mean, we talk about that study of the $400. Um, The thing that I'm most proud of is the fact that after four or five months, the average person using SecureSafe has $400 
after 13 months, the average person is hitting $1,000. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but the average emergency that we see in, in the product and, and SecureSafe is maybe only a couple hundred dollars. It's, it's very small things will trigger this big negative snowball in people's financial lives. And so creating that just even that starting point of saving is so critical. And so we really see a path forward where we can get everybody in America, all the worker, every worker out there should be able to have a workplace emergency savings account and we can solve this problem. Like there is a clear path to make this happen. Mm -hmm. You just said something there, Devin, that, you know, made me think people often have these targets. So, you know, when it comes to emergency savings in the past, a lot of people have said, you know, you should have three months of, you know, a salary saved or six months. Um, Suze, I think, in, Susie, sorry, in the past, I think you've uh, recommended eight to 12 months um, worth of expenses. So, you know, can you recommend a number in today's sort of environment or is it different for every person? Yeah, well, first of all, it's different for every person because some, there are some people that are older and they have Social Security, they have a pension, they have everything coming in that will absolutely pay their monthly expenses. So if they get sick or whatever, they're fine. So it's different for every person. However, you have to differentiate between a savings account that you're building and building and building so that if you lose your job, you get sick and you can't work and you don't have a paycheck coming in anymore. And therefore, how are you going to get by? That's where you need, I still believe it, eight to 12 months of expenses, right? For that, expenses that you have to pay for. What we're talking about, Beth, is an emergency savings account. Why? You are still working. You're still healthy. You still have a paycheck coming in. But guess what? You don't have any money saved. So you don't do the other and you have nothing. And then something hits you. And what do you do? You put it on your credit card. You can't pay it, like I said, in full. And that's the worst time right now because what the feds are doing and the more they raise interest rates or the more they've raised interest rates, the more the interest rate is on those cards. So what we're looking for is this is the starter block. Obviously, we don't expect that you have eight to 12 months of an emergency fund. So this is going to be whatever. This is where you start to learn how to save. This is where all of a sudden you understand, oh my God, savings feels great. I have money. I don't have to go to my credit card that I've already maxed out on now. So now what am I going to do? And then as they start saving there and they see that growing, they then add to that and they start saving or funding other types of you know retirements or paying down their credit cards over here. So they all work hand in hand or better yet for employers, these people are no longer afraid to put money into a retirement account. So because they know they can get at it, they think they can't get at their money in a retirement account. So now all of a sudden you see them in many cases starting to sign up for the Roth 401k or whatever it may be. So do you see how it all works together, which is what financial security is all about. You're working with your money as one in every aspect of it, but it's got to start somewhere. And when you don't have that, the place to start is with an emergency savings account, especially with your employer matching it, that you can take care of the little things that totally put you out of sync with everything else. On the topic of financial security, one thing I must ask you about is the uh, gender discrepancy that came out in the study, the Secure Save study. So um, it seems as if women are perhaps disproportionately affected by some of these challenges, um, perhaps a bit behind in, in terms of kind of general saving. Um, why might that be the case, do you think? Listen, women, for as far back as I can remember, have never asked for what they really knew they were worth. They tend to settle. And it's they always put themselves on sale. You know, in my podcast, Women and Money, that podcast was based on my number one New York Times bestseller that came out in 2007, is still selling to this day, which is don't put yourself on sale. So as long as women put themselves on sale, 
They never really have enough money. And what do they do with their money? They take care of their friends, their family, their parents, and everybody else around them. Because women's nature is to nurture. You know, they give more to others than they give to themselves. And where does that show up? It shows up in every possible way, including their savings accounts. When women finally realize their own value and their own power, and they're doing that more and more every day, oh, those numbers will turn around. What were you going to say, Devin? Yeah, just I was at a conference last week and they talked a lot about, and you mentioned it, the caretaker discrepancy, that there is a growing problem of, you know, as our demographics shift heavily in this country, especially towards we're just going to have a lot larger elderly population and they're living very long and and we don't have a good approach to caretaking in this country. It generally just falls on family and others and predominantly that's women and there's huge costs and sacrifices that come with that. And so that's something that there's, and you mentioned it, Susie, there's very clear data around that. I wouldn't say that is the reason, but it is definitely a structural thing that's, that is, um, that is that we have to overcome uh, as a society. Mm -hmm. I'd like to kind of broaden this now to look at different generations as well. Um, as a young person reading the study, I might take something different out of it than someone who's closer to retirement. So, you know, if we start with younger generations um, who are trying trying to kind of save while also tackling big financial goals, um, what do you think they can kind of take away from this as, as their priorities? Well, <laughs> their priority is their youth. Their priority is time. If there's anything the younger generation needs to understand is that the key ingredient to any financial freedom recipe is compounding. So my favorite example that I love to use is that you start at 25, putting $100 a month into a Roth IRA, for instance, and you do so every single month until you're 65, that's 40 years at the age of 65, with a 12% annual average rate of return, markets can do that for you after a 40-year period of time. You'd have a million dollars. But you think to yourself, I'm still young. I like going out. It doesn't really matter. What difference can $100 a month make? $100 a month over 12 months is $1,200. Over 10 years, it's only $12,000. I'll start at 35 rather than 25. If you start at 35 rather than 25 at 65, you'd have only $300,000. So those seven, so those 10 years cost you $700,000 and that's at $100 a month. So the key is small amounts and that's what Devin and I are talking about. You know, sometimes people think, "Oh, what goods are going to do me? $25 a paycheck, $100 a month, whatever it may be. I just gave you an example of what $100 a month can grow into over a long period of time. And you may think, yeah, but where are you going to get that kind of interest rate right now? With the employer match, with the secure save account, they are getting 12%, 25% return on their money. So if they just kept doing this month in and month out, and they did it for a long period of time, oh my God, the amount of money they could have would be astronomical. So youth, you know, if you're younger, don't think that, oh, I'll just grow up and make more money. No, you start right now and making your money grow and you will have more money than you ever dreamt possible. You want to play and you want to have fun. That's on you later on in life when you can't pay your bills. Yeah, just one, one quick thought from my perspective. I have teenage daughters and we talk money and, and things like that. And, you know, one disadvantage I think young people today have is, is that the world of money, the, the, the variation in products and services, the types of credit cards and loans, it is so much more complicated than it was in prior generations. You have all the same components. You have debt, you have savings vehicles, but it's really hard to like work your way through and understand what's a good product, what's a bad product, how to think about it. And I always boil it back down to my kids and very much what Susie just said, keep it simple. Like this is not, avoid all of that stuff because most of it, the, the things that are complicated and 
and novel, no, they're not all good for people. Um, and definitely if something is confusing and you don't understand it, you're on the bad end of a trade with somebody else. And so keep it simple, $100 a month into a Roth, like very easy things that have existed for a long time are typically the best places to go. But I think as a young person trying to navigate the financial world, you have a disadvantage because of the complexity out there. Yeah, I agree. I wish they drilled that into you in school, <laughs> but uh, hopefully one. Yeah, and they don't. <laughs> exactly. Um, so kind of moving forwards then to maybe the uh, boomers, Gen Xers who are approaching retirement, perhaps they're kind of 10 years out, they've got their house, you know, they're, they've, they're close, to the, close to the end. Um, so, you know, what should they be taking out of this study uh, as they roll towards retirement? Well, what they should be taking is that they are getting older and they have to make some decisions here now, you know, and their decisions really are all about their expenses, because the more expenses you have, the more debt you have, the more income you need when you finally retire. How do you get that income? By having a lot of money in your retirement accounts or investment accounts or you could do, go the other way, and if you know you're going to stay in your home for the rest of your life, if you're lucky enough to own a home today, then make it your number one priority to have the mortgage pay off by the time you retire. Make it your number one priority to stop buying a car every three years when you could just take care of your car and let it go 10 years, 12 years, or longer. Now, stop spending money you don't have to impress people you don't even know or like. So this is the time when you're nearing retirement that if you have a home and maybe you have six or seven kids or whatever it may be, and now they've gotten older and you don't need that huge home anymore, downsize now. Cut your expenses now, right? And of course, have a talk with your kids and get them to understand mommy and daddy are no longer your banks or mommy and mommy or daddy and daddy or just mommy and daddy or whatever it may be. We are no longer your bank account. I am no longer your bank account. So I'm getting to the point where I need my money to be able to support myself. You are young enough now to go out and figure it out. So don't come to me for money. And that is what the line should be if you don't have enough money. Obviously, if you have more than enough money and whatever, you should still tell your kids that so that they understand the responsibility and what it takes to make money. That's what I would tell them. So one thing I've seen recently, uh, there's been a bit of debate uh, in the personal finance world, I suppose, about the feasibility of the 4% rule, which I guess used to be popular where you spend withdraw 4% of your assets every year through retirement. Um, what are your thoughts on that in this kind of inflationary environment? It ties into a lot of things we've already discussed about you know, interest rates and all that sort of stuff. So is 4%, what about the 4% rule today? I think it doesn't work anymore. I think it's very dangerous. I think it should be lowered to at least 3%. I mean, I would be thrilled if you had saved enough money, if you had done things correctly, if you waited to take Social Security, in most cases, not all, till you were 70. If you understood the rules and the tax ramifications of when Medicare premiums be our tax, when your Social Security is taxed, you understand all of that and you work till at least 70 or longer so that your assets have more of a chance to build up and stop this of, oh, I'm going to retire at 60. I'm going to start Social Security at 62. So if you really understood the ramifications of what could happen in a stock market, that are we, is it possible that we could go down for a long period of time and whatever it may be, that you always want to know that you take the least amount possible out of a retirement account, not what you think you, you know, everybody says will work. Because here's the bottom line. Everybody's situation is different. Maybe you were taking out 4% and 4%, even though you didn't need it. And now you get ill. And now you didn't have long-term care insurance. So the more you cannot take out of a retirement account, 
the better you are. So I would not be using the 4% figure on any level. That's great. Thank you. And and just one final question uh, for you both. Uh, I read a stat recently, it was uh, from an analysis done for the Pew Charitable Trusts, uh, which said America's retirement crisis could cost federal and state governments an estimated $1.3 trillion by 2040. Um, it's a relatively new report. Uh, it also suggests that Um, minor increases in what they quote uh, vulnerable households uh, could alleviate the anticipated strain on the budgets. So I wondered if um, you could share maybe how households can achieve these minor increases in savings. Just one or two tips from both of you. I mean, the easiest one I think is more employers need to offer workplace emergency savings accounts. I mean, if you actually thought if you add it up, what would be at least three months, just use that number, three months of dedicated emergency savings for the average worker in the US, it's a couple hundred billion dollars. It's a lot of money, but it's not the 1.4 trillion, I think that you you stated as an example. And so if you want to help people be better prepared for retirement, they need to have more liquid savings that they can go to. Right now, there's there's data that shows you know a few different stats. Like 50% of Americans are not ready for retirement or on track to be ready. Something like 30% of dollars that go into a, a workplace retirement plan like a 401k just come out for loans and hardship withdrawals and things like that. So we need to get people to be better per- involved in retirement accounts at work, keep money in those accounts like Susie talked about. And the best way to do that is to get that extra separate bucket of dollars for emergencies. And for an employee, for an employer, even as our society, that is probably the biggest bang for the buck that we can do to try and both improve the long-term retirement readiness, but also improve people's day-to-day ability to withstand shocks. And those reducing those shocks is going to reduce all the negative things that come with them. And that's going to create a, a, a tremendous positive kind of domino effect for our society. You know, just one quick thing there is that when you use the word vulnerable, we tend to get this image of people who don't make a lot of money, people who da 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 da. No. You know, people who are vulnerable and they're working for minimum wage or whatever, it's very difficult for them to help themselves truthfully, given what's going on with interest rates, inflation, discrimination, and everything else that they have to face, right? And therefore, We really want to solve the problem that you just mentioned. All people who are vulnerable need help, no matter what they look like. Because I can tell you, because nobody talks to as many people as I do when it comes to their money. And that's, you could be vulnerable making $200,000 a year, believe it or not. So who does it fall on, the responsibility? It falls on first the employer's who have the money to help every employee that works for them that is vulnerable regardless of the amount of money they make, number one. And number two, when the employers get involved and help their employees and set up programs like an emergency savings account and the employees start to participate in it and now they feel less vulnerable because they have a savings for the first time, Now we go back to the point that I made earlier with you, Beth, which is they're starting to be self-educated and then the vulnerable start to understand, oh, I like how this feels. I can do this. And then they start to truly change their behavior and all the education in the world. And I can tell you, because I have written 10 consecutive New York Times bestsellers. I, you know, have done more in that aspect of books and educational material. And I can tell you, I can teach them everything possible, but that doesn't mean they're going to do it. What teaches them better than any book, any course, any program out there is to get a taste of what it's like to have money so that they don't feel vulnerable. Then they start to change their ways. And it is very possible that a program like SecureSave.com can solve the, pro- the problem that you just quoted. Well, Susie, Devon, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a really insightful discussion and lots of great takeaways for our watchers there as well. Um, thank you very much for joining us on Chatting with MoneyWise. 